Have you ever been tormented by foreign language book or document reading? Imagine looking up dictionaries and grammar books every night 95 times, that's how much leisure times you run off your life. Our unique magic translation course can teach you how to do it in bilingual style, English, Chinese, Japanese, French, Spanish and so much more, you will get results in just 3 minutes, with very low cost. Find out how at libmind.com. Daniel Kahneman born March 5, 1934 is an Israeli-American psychologist and winner of the 2002 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, notable for his work on behavioral finance and hedonic psychology. With Amos Tversky and others, Kahneman established a cognitive basis for common human errors using heuristics and biases, Kahneman Tversky, 1973, Kahneman, Slavic Tversky, 1982, and developed prospect theory. Kahneman Tversky, 1979. He was awarded the 2002 Nobel Prize in Economics for his work in prospect theory. Currently, he is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Princeton University's Department of Psychology, I in the highly anticipated thinking, fast and slow. Kahneman takes us on a groundbreaking tour of the mind and explains the two systems that drive the way we think. System 1 is fast, intuitive, and emotional, System 2 is slower, more deliberative, and more logical. Kahneman exposes the extraordinary capabilities, and also the faults and biases, of fast thinking, and reveals the pervasive influence of intuitive impressions on our thoughts and behavior. The impact of loss aversion and overconfidence on corporate strategies, the difficulties of predicting what will make us happy in the future, the challenges of properly framing risks at work and at home, the profound effect of cognitive biases on everything from playing the stock market to planning the next vacation, each of these can be understood only by knowing how the two systems work together to shape our judgments and decisions, engaging the reader in a lively conversation about how we think, Kahneman reveals where we can and cannot trust our intuitions, and how we can tap into the benefits of slow thinking. He offers practical and enlightening insights into how choices are made in both our business and our personal lives, and how we can use different techniques to guard against the mental glitches that often get us into trouble. Thinking, fast and slow will transform the way you think about thinking. Here are some of our favorite book quotes and summaries. That we think you will like. A reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. Authoritarian institutions and marketers have always known this fact. Nothing in life is as important as you think it is. While you are thinking about it our comforting conviction that the world makes sense rests on a secure foundation, our almost unlimited ability to ignore our ignorance. I have always believed that scientific research is another domain where a form of optimism is essential to success. I have yet to meet a successful scientist who lacks the ability to exaggerate the importance of what he or she is doing, and I believe that someone who lacks a delusional sense of significance will wilt in the face of repeated experiences of multiple small failures and rare successes, the fate of most researchers. A reliable way of making people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition, because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. Mood evidently affects the operation of System 1. When we are uncomfortable and unhappy, we lose touch with our intuition. These findings add to the growing evidence that good mood, intuition, creativity, gullibility, and increased reliance on system one form a cluster. At the other pole, sadness, vigilance, suspicion, and analytic approach, and increased effort also go together. A happy mood loosens the control of system two over performance. When in a good mood, people become more intuitive and more creative but also less vigilant and more prone to logical errors. Confidence is a feeling, which reflects the coherence of the information and the cognitive ease of processing it. It is wise to take admissions of uncertainty seriously, but declarations of high confidence mainly tell you that an individual has constructed a coherent story in his mind, not necessarily that the story is true. Acquisition of skills requires a regular environment, an adequate opportunity to practice, and rapid and unequivocal feedback about the correctness of thoughts and actions. People tend to assess the relative importance of issues by the ease with which they are retrieved from memory, and this is largely determined by the extent of coverage in the media. Frequently mentioned topics populate the mind even as others slip away from awareness. 
In turn, what the media choose to report corresponds to their view of what is currently on the public's mind. It is no accident that authoritarian regimes exert substantial pressure on independent media, because public interest is most easily aroused by dramatic events and by celebrities. Media feeding frenzies are common we focus on our goal, anchor on our plan, and neglect relevant base rates, exposing ourselves to the planning fallacy. We focus on what we want to do and can do, neglecting the plans and skills of others. Both in explaining the past and in predicting the future, we focus on the causal role of skill and neglect the role of luck. We are therefore prone to an illusion of control. We focus on what we know and neglect what we do not know, which makes us overly confident in our beliefs. A simple rule can help, before an issue is discussed, all members of the committee should be asked to write a very brief summary of their position. This procedure makes good use of the value of the diversity of knowledge and opinion in the group. The standard practice of open discussion gives too much weight to the opinions of those who speak early and assertively, causing others to line up behind them. We have all heard such stories of expert intuition, the chess master who walks past a street game and announces white mates in three without stopping, or the physician who makes a complex diagnosis after a single glance at a patient. Expert intuition strikes us as magical, but it is not. Indeed, each of us performs feats of intuitive expertise many times each day. Most of us are pitch perfect in detecting anger in the first word of a telephone call. Recognize as we enter a room that we were the subject of the conversation, and quickly react to subtle signs that the driver of the car in the next lane is dangerous. Our everyday intuitive abilities are no less marvelous than the striking insights of an experienced firefighter or physician, only more common. The psychology of accurate intuition involves no magic. Perhaps the best short statement of it is by the great Herbert Simon, who studied chess masters and showed that after thousands of hours of practice they come to see the pieces on the board differently from the rest of us. You can feel Simon's impatience with the mythologizing of expert intuition when he writes, the situation has provided a cue, this cue has given the expert access to information stored in memory, and the information provides the answer. Intuition is nothing more and nothing less than recognition. However, optimism is highly valued, socially and in the market, people and firms reward the providers of dangerously misleading information more than they reward truth-tellers. One of the lessons of the financial crisis that led to the Great Recession is that there are periods in which competition, among experts and among organizations, creates powerful forces that favor a collective blindness to risk and uncertainty. If you care about being thought credible and intelligent, do not use complex language where simpler language will do. My Princeton colleague Danny Oppenheimer refuted a myth prevalent among undergraduates about the vocabulary that professors find most impressive. In an article titled Consequences of Erudite Vernacular Utilized Irrespective of Necessity, Problems with Using Long Words Needlessly, he showed that couching familiar ideas in pretentious language is taken as a sign of poor intelligence and low credibility. Jumping to conclusions is efficient if the conclusions are likely to be correct and the costs of an occasional mistake acceptable. Jumping to conclusions is risky when the situation is unfamiliar. The stakes are high and there is no time to collect more information. The experiencing self does not have a voice. The remembering self is sometimes wrong, but it is the one that keeps score and governs what we learn from living, and it is the one that makes decisions. What we learn from the past is to maximize the qualities of our future memories, not necessarily of our future experience. This is the tyranny of the remembering self. People who are poor think like traitors but the dynamics are quite different. Unlike traders, the poor are not indifferent to the differences between gaining and giving up. Their problem is that all their choices are between losses. Money that is spent on one good is the loss of another good that could have been purchased instead. For the poor, costs are losses. The illusion that one has understood the past feeds the further illusion that one can predict and control the future. These illusions are comforting. They reduce the anxiety that we would experience if we allowed ourselves to fully acknowledge the uncertainties of existence. We all have a need for the reassuring message that actions have appropriate consequences, and that success will reward wisdom and courage. Many business books are tailor-made to satisfy this need. If you are genetically endowed with an optimistic bias, you hardly need to be told that you are.